Welcome to Auto Mundial, the weekly car news and review show where this week we have Ford's all new mini truck, the Maverick. Is it good enough to tackle the Hyundai Santa Cruz? We also have Mercedes AMG's updated GT4 door and a new electric SUV from BMW. The updated Land Rover Discovery takes on the Audi Q7 and we have Hyundai's bold new Ionic 5. Is it the new go-to electric family hatch? That's all coming up. First though, the news. Production of the hotly anticipated Ford Bronco has begun. Ford's Wayne, Michigan factory has started building both Bronco and Bronco Sport models ready to fill the 125,000 orders that Ford has already received. A further 190,000 Broncos have been reserved across the USA and Canada and as such Ford has been busy bulking up its production facilities. And as we know, any good 4x4 needs some decent accessories, so Ford has also built a new modification centre opposite the Wayne factory to produce everything from roof racks to stickers. $750 million has been invested into the Michigan assembly plant, with an additional 2,700 jobs created to satisfy the demand for the Jeep Wrangler rival, with customer deliveries due to start this summer. In the last couple of years, we've had designers getting really creative with their EVs. The Honda E, for example, shows Honda's rarely seen fun side, while the Porsche Taycan and Audi e-tron GT show how low and sleek a car can look without the need for an engine under the bonnet. Hyundai Ionic, though, has always been a little more conventional. A four-door saloon favoured by minicab drivers and company car fleets, it has always been a good car, but not an especially exciting one. That looks like it could all be about to change though with this, the all-new Ionic 5. Far cry from the old model, Hyundai has ditched the saloon body in favour of a hatchback to rival the likes of the Volkswagen ID3. But on the styling front, that's where the similarities to the ID3 end. Where the Volkswagen is conservative so as to not put off first time EV customers, the Ionic is a real head turner. Every side is covered in sharp creases and angles that set it apart from just about everything else on the roads. The design language was inspired by a concept car from 1974 called the Hyundai Pony Coupe, with various flat surfaces and lots of glass. There are nice touches like the clamshell bonnet and flush door handles, and some beautiful slim LED headlights tucked away in the front fascia. In the cabin, things are a little more conventional, but still ultra stylish. The floor-mounted batteries and lack of engine have resulted in a spacious, airy interior that looks as if it could have come from a high-end office furniture shop. A pair of big screens top off the modern cabin, while the reclining seats look perfect for napping in while you wait for your car to charge. Speaking of charging, the Ionic 5 is capable of super fast charging, something usually reserved for Porsche Taycans and Teslas, meaning it can go from 10 to 80% in 17 minutes with a 350 kilowatt hour charger. Two different battery packs are on offer, three power outputs and rear or all wheel drive. In the most affordable configuration, it produces 168 brake horsepower and will hit 62 miles per hour from rest in 8.5 seconds and achieve 240 miles on a single charge. 
top spec cars get a power boost to 215 brake horsepower and can do 0 to 62 in 7.4 seconds. The range is improved too, up to 300 miles. Prices start at just under £37,000, with deliveries starting this year. When the fifth generation of the Land Rover Discovery was first revealed in 2016, it caused quite a stir with its bold new look, leaving behind many of the trademark styling cues of older models like the vertically orientated taillights and asymmetric rear windscreen. It was bigger than old versions too, but a lot lighter thanks to its all aluminium construction and more luxurious, further narrowing the gap between Discovery and Range Rover. And now, for 2021, it's had a mid-life refresh. On the face of it, the changes are initially hard to spot. It gets some new headlights and an updated front bumper with some redesigned air intakes. At the back, the rear lights have been changed while there's a whole new range of alloy wheel options to choose from. Sadly for some, the awkward-looking off-center rear number plate remains unchanged, with the repositioned Discovery badging doing little to divert the eye. The Discovery's interior was already one of our favorites in this class, but now it is even better with Land Rover's new Pivi Pro infotainment system on a bigger 11-inch screen and a few styling tweaks here and there, including some new controls for the heating and aircon. The Pivi Pro system is both larger and brighter than the old one and easier to use. The rest of the cabin remains as spacious and practical as ever, with loads of space throughout and the nifty electric folding seats helping to make this one of the best cars out there for big families. Under the bonnet, the Discovery gets a new host of engines with an array of JLR's latest four and six cylinders. The petrol range kicks off with the 2.0-litre P300 producing 296 brake horsepower, while a bigger 3.0-litre motor rounds off the petrol options with 355 bhp thanks to an electric supercharger and mild hybrid system. This is the fastest model on offer, hitting 62 miles per hour from rest in 6.5 seconds. The diesel selection consists of a 3-litre six-cylinder mild hybrid with either 247 or 296 bhp and a towing capacity of up to 3.5 tonnes. All models come with an 8-speed auto box and, naturally, four-wheel drive. And that is where the Discovery aims to stand apart from its rivals. It comes with Land Rover's tried and tested Terrain Response 2 system that automatically optimizes the car for whatever surface you happen to be driving on. However, while this is still one of the most impressive off-road vehicles on the market, it still needs to hold its own against more road-focused rivals. And this is the car that the Land Rover really needs to beat, the latest Audi Q7. Like the Discovery, the Q7 has had a recent facelift with an even bolder new look and more tech than the International Space Station. The already big grille has followed the current trend for German cars and has become even bigger with more chrome and some swanky new LED headlights. The front and rear bumpers have been reworked as have the side sills and tailpipes, giving the Q7 a fresh new look. Other updates include some chassis tweaks and a new mild hybrid system carried over from the A8 limo. Perhaps the biggest change though is the new interior. Like the closely related Q8 SUV Coupe, the Q7 gets Audi's gorgeous new generation of infotainment, incorporating two screens, one in the dash and one in the centre console. Both are touch sensitive with the top screen taking care of multimedia navigation and vehicle settings while the lower screen operates the climate control. The Q7, like the Discovery, gets seven seats, although it isn't quite as spacious. It isn't as off-road focused either, although we do prefer the interior and the build quality is first class. 
The Land Rover then is still right up there with the class leaders. It's well equipped, endlessly practical and gives an ineffable sense of ruggedness off-road. Mercedes AMG GT four-door is Merck's flagship performance saloon, and it's great. Available in the UK only in top-spec GT63 S trim, it produces 630 brake horsepower and an ungodly noise. However, it's always had a bit of a problem. Why would you spend 140 odd thousand pounds on a big V8 AMG saloon when you could save 40 grand and buy the other big V8 AMG saloon, the E63? In the UK then, they're a pretty rare sight, but elsewhere the GT four door makes a bit more sense. You see, in Germany, for example, Buyers can opt for smaller six-cylinder versions that bring the prices somewhat more in line with the fast E-Class. And now there's a new one. Well, we say new, but we really mean ever so slightly updated. And we think the GT53 now has more cores than ever to be sold in Britain. Most of the updates are very minor. There are some new colour and upholstery options, new trim options and new choices of alloy wheels. The main changes though are under the skin. The adaptive air suspension has been overhauled with some new adjustable dampers and pressure limiting valves, whatever they might be. The bottom line is, according to Mercedes, improved handling as well as ride comfort. For now, these updates are only available on the six-cylinder cars, but with that fancy new suspension and a host of new options to choose from, we think now is as good a time as any to bring the cheaper GTs to the UK. Join us again after the break as we check out the all-electric BMW iX and the new Ford Maverick. Coming up, Ford's new £16,000 pickup truck, but first... It's fair to say that we've been somewhat critical of BMW's new design language here at Auto Mundial, with cars like the new 7 Series, X5 and X7 displaying some truly enormous front grilles. By far the biggest culprit though was surely the new 4 Series, with its divisive buck teeth, we're slowly but surely getting used to it now. However, BMW isn't done just yet. This is the new iX, and it makes the new 4 Series styling seem positively mundane. And it isn't just the front end that's got us scratching our heads, the whole design is full of strange, rather futuristic styling cues. But it's 2021, and we've come to expect controversial designs from BMW by now. So let's not focus on the subjective matter of styling, and instead look at what this car is. Built to take on the likes of the Audi e-tron and Mercedes EQC, the iX is an all-electric SUV inspired by 2018's iNext concept. A 100 kilowatt hour battery sits under the floor sending power to two electric motors, one for each axle. Total power is said to be in excess of 500 brake horsepower giving the X5 sized SUV a 0-62 mph time of under 5 seconds. What's likely to be of more concern to iX buyers though is the impressive 376 mile range. The battery can be charged at a rate of 200 kilowatt hours, meaning you will be able to reach an 80% charge in under 40 minutes. The cabin is pretty space-age too, and a real step forward for BMW interiors. 
It's clean and simple, with everything from the speakers to the air vents having been blended into their surroundings. There's an interestingly shaped steering wheel, a big pair of bright screens, and all the switches are almost hidden in what BMW calls Shytech. It really is beautiful, with switches disguised within a little wooden control panel in the center console next to the elegant crystal-like iDrive controller. But is a flashy interior enough to make up for that divisive exterior styling? Well, if you really can't get over the looks, there are options out there. This is the Mercedes EQC, and we think it's one of the best-looking SUVs of any sort on the market right now. Unlike the Tesla Model X or Jaguar I-Pace, the EQC doesn't shout about its electric credentials, instead looking like pretty much any other big Merc 4x4. It's a similar story inside too, where anyone who's ever travelled in a modern Mercedes will feel immediately at home. There are no TV-sized touchscreens or gullwing doors to swoon over, instead it's all very normal. In fact, the only real differences from a regular Mercedes interior are some very different air vents, some tasteful copper accents and a sweeping panel running from the doors to the back of the dashboard. Powering the EQC is an 85 kilowatt battery hooked up to two electric motors producing 402 brake horsepower. That power is sent to all four wheels resulting in a 0-62 time of just 5.1 seconds. That's not bad for a 2.5 ton SUV, although top speed is capped at 112 miles per hour. However, the Merc doesn't get as much cutting-edge tech as the BMW. Its range isn't as good either as a WLTP confirmed 241 miles. The BMW then, if you can look past the questionable design, looks like it could be a new class leader. But we'll have to wait for it to hit showrooms at the end of the year to really find out. For years now, the smallest Ford truck you could buy has been the Ranger. Capable and affordable, and more compact than the F-150, it's always been a strong seller for them, even in Europe. Now though, Ford is entering into a new section of the market with this, the all-new Maverick. Built on the same platform as the new Bronco Sport, the Maverick will be the brand's cheapest truck and by some margin. Prices start at just over $21,500. That's cheap for a hatchback, never mind a pickup truck. Ford is aiming the Maverick at young customers who normally wouldn't consider a big gas guzzling truck, but Ford reckons buyers will remain brand loyal, eventually making their way up to a full size F 150. So, what do you get for your $21,500? Well, if we're honest, not a great deal. All trim levels will come as standard with a 2.5 litre four cylinder petrol engine hooked up to a hybrid system for about 190 brake horsepower. Entry level Mavericks, though, are only available with front wheel drive, so don't expect it to keep up with a Ranger on the trails. The interior isn't exactly plush either, with a dated steering wheel and lots of cheap plastics. That's not a great deal of kit either, but at this price, who really cares? Step up to the XLT and top of the range Lariat trim levels and things get better. Even the high spec cars are very well priced with the Lariat starting at under 27,000. Four wheel drive is optional but only if you upgrade to the smaller but more powerful 250 horsepower 2 litre. This ditches the hybrid system but provides better performance and greatly improved towing capacity. The $24,000 mid-range XLT seems like the best option to us. It's still basic, but it adds some nice creature comforts like cruise control, electric mirrors and a power-locking tailgate. There are loads of option packs too if you fancy things like dual-zone climate control and electric seats. However, Ford is not alone in the return of the mini-truck market. Hyundai has had a go too, with this, the Santa Cruz. Like the Maverick, it has SUV underpinnings and pairs them with a truck bed and cool styling. 
But while the Ford is targeted at young buyers and commercial buyers, the Hyundai seems a bit more consumer friendly. It's loaded with tech and gets a real premium interior. It looks more like an SUV too, although both these trucks look fantastic in their own ways. There are two powertrain options for the Santa Cruz, both meaty 2.5 litre four cylinders. The first produces 190 horsepower with the upgraded turbocharged 2.5, putting out 275. Both are hooked up to an 8 speed automatic transmission, with the higher spec model getting a dual clutch. Both versions get all wheel drive and locking differentials, meaning it should hold its own over rougher terrain. Prices for the Hyundai have not yet been announced, but we expect them to be a fair bit higher than the Ford. The Ford Maverick then, while basic, looks to be another pickup truck success for Ford. The F-150 is America's best-selling vehicle, so we imagine the Maverick will do well too. Sadly though, like the Hyundai, it isn't coming to Europe. Join us again next week on Auto Mundial as we check out the new Audi Q4 e-tron.